Okay, so we should start. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the Time Making webinar organized by the St. George on a Bike Project. I am Rose Gregorio, the Dissemination Officer of St. George on a Bike. Uh, the instructors of this webinar are Maria Cristina Marinescu, Senior Researcher of Semantic Technologies at BSE and the coordinator of St. George on a Bike. Joaquin More Lopez, Natural Language Processing Expert at BSE. Artem Rachetnikov, Deep Learning Researcher at BSC. And we were supposed to have Albin Larsen, analyst from Europeana, but he was not able to join us today because of personal reasons. Um, I would like to, uh, in, in place of um, Albin, we have um, Antoine Isaac, who will be um, answering whatever questions you may have uh, regarding what Euro Europeana is doing. Um, I would just like to remind you that being recorded, please keep your cameras off and mics off and ask questions by chat. Uh, instructors will answer your questions at the end of each talk. Uh, now I will give the floor to Maria Cristina, who will give an introduction to this webinar. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Rose. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to wish you a good morning and thanks everyone for being here. I hope you'll have a very fun time listening to this webinar and I also hope you're going to find it interesting enough to ask a lot of questions. So, um, as Rose was saying, and please let me know over chat if you have problems seeing my presentations, my presentation. Uh, I'm Maria Cristina Marinescu and I'm opening this first dissemination event for our project by explaining first what is the motivation, why are we doing this project, what moves us to do this project, um, both from a conceptual view and from a technical view. Then I'll explain very shortly what is the main challenge that we're encountering and um, a little bit of a roadmap of how we go from what present tools um, are able to do to where we want to get to. And on this way, I'm going to explain again very briefly, um, well, define what the time matrix is. This is a webinar about time matrix. So what is this time matrix and how it helps us going from where we are now to where we want to go to. Okay. Um, let me motivate first how this project came to be. This is a CEF, Connecting European Facility Project. It's a European project. It's not a horizon, though. And this was a call for generic services for public open data. Within this public open data call, um, researchers can use any, pretty much any um, type of domain that they want to. We focus on cultural heritage. Why did we do that? We did that for two reasons, conceptually. First, uh, Europe is one of the world's uh, center, oldest center of culture, and the European Union is trying to uh, preserve the cultural heritage that it has and to push for people to uh, be proud of it and use it in many different innovative ways. Okay, so um, cultural heritage is a way to understand the past, to understand how cultures influence each other how they're similar, how they're different. Um, it's a way to understand history. And it's also a way to maybe see how issues that are very present nowadays about gender, minorities, migration um, have occurred in the past. Um, and that would hopefully make us more tolerant and would help us approach the, approach the future in a way um, and inspire us. Okay. This is the conceptual part. The technical part is also interesting for us because um, cultural heritage is something that everybody knows about, but there's very little investment, let's say. So um, there's the, the data that exists there is of pretty poor quality. When I say data, I don't mean pictures of the works of art. We have that. 
What I mean is data that is associated with these pictures, descriptions of what's going on, even labels of what's going on, uh, so that we can find quickly, access quickly, uh, search, analyze, and do interesting things with this data. Okay, so what would we be able to do if we had this kind of good descriptions, good metadata? Metadata being uh, information about the data. Okay? Well, we we're able to uh, have uh, projects in museums, uh, tourism, cultural, we can have in education projects, we can do research, and we can also touch on social things like improving web for the access, uh, web accessibility for the blind. Okay? So we found this as a big opportunity uh, and we decided that in this project we're going to do metadata enrichment and especially we're focusing on the collections from the Europeana Foundation which is our partner in this project. Okay. What's our quest? Not more and not less that endow artificial intelligence with culture symbols and tradition inside. This is difficult because an image is not just what you see, it's all the context around it when this picture was created. Without placing an image, a work of art, in the context, we are going to miss on a lot of information, okay? A lot of rich information about cultures and symbols and, and tradition, okay? Um, in these two half days, you're gonna see how we start from mostly images, but also text. And we use semantic information to link things, natural language models to capture common sense, which is generally missing in um, deep learning approaches. And deep learning to predict how we combine these three things to do a good job and, and help um, um, artificial intelligence in understand better culture. Okay. Um, now, it is entirely possible that a lot of you uh, registered from, or at least some of you registered for this webinar, intrigued by the name of the project. So um, let's take our frequent character, painting character, St. George, and see what we can do with paintings of St. George with the current tools that exist out there. Okay. What are we trying to do? We're starting from images and we're trying to generate good descriptions with metadata, good uh, uh, improve object detection and improve uh, generation of description of the images. Okay? So by using these tools, uh, we're getting, for example, for the same, well, different paintings of St. George on a horse killing the dragon, we get a dog laying on the ground, a couple of people riding a motorcycle, couple of cats on a rock, a man with a motorcycle. Okay? And even for this very simple... So, uh, sorry, Maria Cristina. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, are you showing your slides? Absolutely. Okay, sorry. Uh, you, you, you are not sharing your screen. You couldn't see. Oh, Jesus. Sorry about that. That's what I was asking you to... Okay. Oh, oh this is not a good thing. I thought that you could see that. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see how this goes. What am I gonna do? Should I? Okay, sorry. Um, do you see this, the slides now? Do you see them in presentation mode? Yes, yes. Okay, well, really sorry for that. We'll see how this goes. Um, no, this is not good. Uh, anyway, um, let me get back to, do you see the entire screen now? Yes. Okay. So these are the paintings that I was telling you about with uh, the current tools. You're basically getting these captions. So this is St. George on a horse, and you're getting dogs on the ground, people riding a motorcycle. Then you're getting cats on a rock. Okay? Even for this very simple uh, painting, very clear painting, 
you're basically getting a woman laying on the floor with a stuffed animal. So obviously there's a problem here and an opportunity for us. So instead of uh, getting dogs, cats, motorcycles, stuffed animals, and generic people, we would like to get uh, dragons, horses, and be able to refine persons to be knights, or even better, St. George, if we can do it. So that's why we decided to combine uh, in the title of our project, the motorcycles with St. George. And um, just by, uh, by chance, we found this graffiti next to one of our houses, which is uh, a person on a motorbike uh, trying to kill the drag. So the fact that these captions are so bad doesn't mean that the tools are are not good. The tools are actually excellent for generating captions for um, recent things, everyday image things. Why? Because they're trained on very large data sets of pictures of actual things of real life. Okay, The recent pictures where dragons don't appear, um, St. George doesn't appear, and so on. So, these are the reasons why the tools that work really well for current things don't work well for cultural heritage. And these are a little bit the reasons. Uh, excuse me. So the, oh man, I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, the size of the data set is very small compared to recent pictures. We cannot take new pictures of witches or dragons. We have the paintings that we have. There are a lot of imaginary beings in these paintings that don't exist in real life. You have unicorns, you have devils, you have angels. Okay? Um, symbols, they're also represented in paintings and they are not represented in everyday pictures. You're not gonna see a representation of uh, the attack or um, the Annunciation. There's a lot of styles in painting. And finally, uh, this is our favorite victim for uh, the webinar that we're having today and tomorrow, which is time. Okay. What is the problem with time? Well, there are different project problems with time, and I'm going to illustrate them with, uh, again, with some captions. So for those of you that don't know, this is an inkwell. Okay. You put the pen there and then use the ink to write, okay? This thing is not in use anymore. Um, as a result, uh, I don't know how many pictures of this there are in our uh, data set. I will talk about, uh, or my colleagues are gonna talk about the data set later. We're basically using the Coco data set. Um, but the, the tool has generated a blender on a counter, okay? And for a printing press, it generated a man on a table. This is because, excuse me, this is because these are objects that are not in use anymore. There are also other objects that exist, they are in use, but they have different shape now than they used to have. For example, a plow. I don't know if all of you know what a plow is. It's something that you use to like, before uh, putting the seeds in the ground, okay? You have to like um, work the, the, the earth. So this is what a plow used to look like, both in pictures, older pictures, um, well, pictures from remote places where they still use this, and paintings, okay? And the captions don't detect a plow. It's like people playing frisbee and so on for the same reason. And uh, lastly, there are objects that have a very similar shape, but they're very different types of objects than uh, in the present and in the past. For example, here uh, we detect that the current state of the art tools detect a cell phone when it's actually a book or it detects a laptop and a teddy bear when it's actually a book uh, and uh, a bird. Okay? So um, I'm not going to go in any of these details, but uh, basically what you're gonna see um, in the next talks um, you're going to see how we can improve object identification by using uh, the context, the time context when this uh, paintings were created. So basically by placing 
an, a misidentified object in the correct, correct time frame, we improve, uh, we correct the detection of that object. And instead of saying that it's a laptop, we say, for example, that it's a book. Okay. So um, here is where I should be defining time matrix. Time matrix is, um, is not as easy to define in half a minute, but um, the idea is the following. Think of an image that is being represented as a matrix. A matrix where you have high probabilities, where you, in those places, in, in the image where you detect, for example, a teddy bear or a motorcycle, okay? you apply information that uh, we record in a table, which you're seeing here on the right hand side, that contains for each class label, the first time of use of that word. And when applying this type of information, the matrix of the image is going to get modified such that where you before um, identified a laptop, now you're identifying the book. Okay, so this is sort of like the, the big picture. And uh, you're gonna see in one of the talks today how we're doing this. The process is considerably more complicated. Um, with this information, you basically, the, the basic idea is that with this information on, on first time use, you correct the object detection. And um, in a bounding box where you first detected teddy bear, you would detect a person. Where actually there's a princess and we're gonna see how we go from teddy bear to person and how we go from person to princess. Okay? So there are several, um, several techniques that we're using in a bigger workflow. Let me just um, sort of wrap up with a, um, a short example. This is our painting, for example, one of the paintings in our training set. I hope all of you know what bounding boxes are. I kind of drew them here by hand. So basically there in, in this place, there's, there would be a bounding box that says it's a teddy bear. Here you would have a bike, a horse or a zebra. Then you would have a baseball bat or a sword, a dog and a person. And we will see how applying this notion of a time matrix, we, we um, see that teddy bear, bike and baseball bat are anachronic given that the painting was from, well, is from the 16th century. We transform those using the time matrix. And then from here, using a different process that is based on language, which you're gonna see tomorrow, you generate even more specific labels, including labels that do not exist um, to start with in our, um, in our set. Okay. So things like princess or knight or have dog and dragon. Okay. Um, to close up, I just want to say that um, I hope you are excited about hearing all these details. And this was a little bit of a hook onto um, um, onto what my technical colleagues are going to explain next and tomorrow. But I just want to say that what you're gonna see different from most of the tools is that we're not only using uh, deep learning techniques, uh, which we are, but we're also using semantic metadata extraction and language-based model to improve uh, this labeling, to improve the detection of the objects and to generate um, eventually captions uh, that provide better descriptions and that can be helpful for all kinds of uh, interesting projects. Thank you very much. And I'm really sorry for the incident at the beginning with uh, you not seeing the first slide. Uh, if you have any questions now, uh, Rose, I don't know how many minutes I have. Yeah. Um... Well, we have about a minute, <laughs> if anyone has any questions. Okay. okay, well, if nobody has questions, let's move on to the next talk um, by Joaquin More Lopez called AI Powered Semantic Labeling of Image Datasets.
Can you see my slide now? Yes. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, um, well, my name is uh, Joaquin More. Good morning. I am the computational linguist at uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And I'm a computational linguist guy working for the St. George and Apai project. Uh, in this presentation, I will briefly show you the semantic uh, labeling of current, of current uh, image data sets. It's a kind of state-of-the-art uh, presentation because the, the topic is important because these data sets, these image data sets, are used for training systems that uh, are able to perform the descriptions of images and of course, uh, paintings, which is the main topic of the, of the webinar. So after presenting the, this state-of-the-art uh, database picture, I will present the, or I will explain the rationale and the reason why and the purpose of the time matrix, which is consistent to the, the things we will talk about uh, current uh, data sets. So the contents are this. First of all, I will uh, explain the semantic labeling in, in image uh, data sets. Then I will uh, show or explain the challenges that these kind of data sets uh, pose, and we want to, to work on this. Then after explaining the challenges, I will explain the time matrix, the reason why of the time matrix notion. And then we will uh, see what, is, what the, is the purpose of this, of this notion, the time matrix notion. So, okay, let's first start with uh, semantic leveling and images in the mix databases. So, uh, databases, the, the data spaces I, I will show you can be grouped according to the kind of, uh, of label uh, they use. On the one hand, we have the, the data sets labeled with Warnet uh, uh, labels. I will explain what Warnet is for those who are not familiar with this kind of uh, resource. But anyway, the, the group of the Warnet labels are uh, ImageNet, Visual Genome. Then we will see uh, other data sets uh, whose labels are uh, in-house, so they, they use their own labels. And then we will explain uh, data sets which are labeled according to them to the, the Wikipedia data set. This, this Wikimedia labeling, it's not, will be explained fully in the second uh, tomorrow session. So in this uh, presentation, I will focus on the Warner labels, labels and the in-house uh, labels. So <clears throat> I have talked about labels, but the, the question is, what things are labeled? So we have uh, to distinguish those image data sets that uh, label entities according to a taxonomy, which is uh, ImageNet, uh, Wikimedia, and Open Images. Then we uh, have those data sets that put these entities in relation to each other, which is uh, the, from the one, from one side, we have those which uh, where the relationships are described in sentences, which is which are the, the captions, and then there are the other uh, the other data sets where the relations are explained in a more formal way uh, as uh, visual relations. So well, let's see the, um, the, tax the, the taxonomy classes. 
one of the most uh, popular um, data sets is ImageNet. ImageNet is a, is a data set uh, of, of uh, pictures, of uh, images that depict uh, an entity, just an entity, an, a train, a car, a dog, uh, whatever. And this uh, image is labeled uh, according to the WarNet uh, uh, group or the WarNet class. Well, uh, first of all, let me explain more or less what a WarNet is. WarNet is a taxonomy, a lexical taxonomy uh, provided by the Stanford University, in which the idea is to organize the English lexicon according to concepts and according to and according to um, a, ta a taxonomy where concepts are a part of a more uh, general uh, concept. For instance, in the case of train, we say that a train is a kind of uh, means of transport and a means of transport is a kind of artifact and so on. So the idea uh, by Stanford University was to map this uh, lexical taxonomy onto images. So in the, in the ImageNet uh, uh, image you have here, you can see images of train, which are labeled as train, railroad train. This is the, the WordNet label. And as you see, this, uh, this label depends on the, the class public transport, which in turn uh, depends on conveyance transport and instrumentality. These labels are called scene sets because in, in WordNet, the, the, the groups are uh, called scene sets, which means that uh, they identify, they identify uh, uh, an image according to a specific sense of the word. So one thing is, for instance, bank, since it's bank one, which means uh, the bank of the river, and one thing is since it's two, which is the bank as a financial, as a financial thing. So there will be an image for bank one and an image for bank two. So this is the, this is the, the idea. Well, so ImageNet is a database, an image database based on this kind of taxonomy. But on the other side, we have open images where the images are also organized in a taxonomy, but the taxonomy is, uh, is prepared or is, it was uh, made in-house. They use their internal classes and their internal groups. And, but all of them depend on the superclass, which is the uh, ident uh, entity class. Well, <clears throat> not all the, um, the image uh, data sets are uh, representations or are, are images of uh, just an entity. They also uh, represent, or the, the labels also represent um, relations between, uh, between classes. One of the most, uh, in, one of the most used uh, image that I said, which reflect these interrelations, these relationships between entities, is the COCO data set. That COCO data set will be, very, uh, will be familiar at the end of this webinar. We will talk about the, this data set uh, quite often. The, the COCO data set um, identifies or, or describes what is depicted in the image by means of what is called a caption. A caption is a sentence that describes what is going on in the picture. So in the, in, in the left uh, hand side example, we see the picture and see, see that a man on a skateboard walking the dog. The thing is that for each image, 
five human five human people brought uh, how uh, the, the, the represent what is depicted and for each image there are five versions of the same thing so that means that uh, five people brought the same what they think the picture depicts and you have these uh, these five alternatives okay so for each uh, image there are five uh, different there are uh, five different captions so the coco data set the captions in coco data set were made manually people writing typing the 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 caption whereas in the conceptual captions the idea is to uh, take the text that describes what's going on in the picture but instead of doing it manually they um, uh, gathered the alt text uh, tag in the html web page and so the the captions were collected were grabbed automatically well so we saw entity interactions using captions but there are other um, data sets that uh, represent this in a different way in a more logical form way this is the example of the visual genome uh, data set where they distinguish here the, e the entities that participate in the event depicted uh, in the image. So notice here the famous bounding boxes. The bounding boxes are the, the squares, the frames, uh, sorry, the squares that frame an entity. In, in this case, we see the bounding box of the of the man jumping and, uh, and, and all the other objects. And of course, the idea is not just um, uh, representing or saying that there is a man and uh, whatever, but also saying what, what are the relation or the main relations that uh, these entities participate. And the idea is to represent this in a kind of formal way, in a tree form uh, way, in which the, um, the, the main node is what is called the predicate, which is the name of the relationship between the, the entities and the, and the entities, the, particip the participants are uh, under this, uh, this uh, relation. For instance, uh, notice that you, we have here a standing, and uh, the standing is a, a, a is a, a it's an action or is a is an event where the woman participates, and there are also other relationships which are the location relationships, like is behind or is in and what, or even there is a relationship with this the action itself, which is jumping over where there is the person or the, the, the entity who performs this action and the place over which uh, the, action, the action is done. The thing is that the visual relations are, um, are represented by the visual genome by using Warnet uh, levels. So, if you see the, um, the, the, the figure, we, we can see the frequency of, um, of, entity, of relations and, and entities. And you can see, for instance, uh, woman N01 and fly and water uh, N01. That means that it's the sense of man, which is the in this case is the most frequent. And it, there is a, a label, which is the, 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 the relation word, and the woman with the mean, the sense of woman here. So, for instance, in that case, uh, imagine that there, there is a train uh, over a bridge. 
So the train will be labeled according to the warned sense, which is the means of transport. So uh, train will not be labeled in the meaning of a train of ca or, or the train as a caravan of camels and mules. Or so this is important. They they distinguish it, they distinguish the different senses of the of the words uh, referring to the entities involved. Another way of representing uh, the visual relations between entities is by uh, mapping the relationships on a graph. So in here on the left hand side, we see the caption, a brown dog uh, bite a gray dog car. So there is an action which is bite and then uh, two dogs involved, dog one, dog two and the, they uh, participate or they are related with the relation by. And this is uh, represented as a graph, which is called a, a visual graph. But in the open images that are set uh, by Google, they represent this kind of relationships by using a very, uh, very simple way, which is a tripod, uh, a, a tuple with three, uh, elements. The first element is one, um, one of the entity involved, which is generally the person who performs the action. Then the second element of the, of the couple is the relation word that uh, plays a bit of visual relation. And then the second, uh, the, sorry, the third uh, element of the couple is the other um, entity involved, which can be the, the patient, the object, and the other. So if doc one bites doc two, in the, the tuple, you will see doc one or doc uh, bite uh, uh, the, the, the other doc. And in the, in the, the examples here, you have that uh, the relationship between uh, the girl which is standing on a horse, it's represented as a couple, which is girl on horse. The, the second element of the tuple, which is the word that refers to the visual relation, uh, are generally verbs prepos and prepositions. And the list of uh, possible uh, uh, relational words is quite, um, is quite limited. So, they're not, there's not a, a huge number of, of visual relation words. So, more or less, this is the, the big picture of uh, open data sets, um, more or less the, the current systems that identify or describe images are based on. Coco dataset is the one which is more or less the standard, which uh, many or most of the of the um, systems that describe uh, images uh, use Coco dataset. And now the, the the challenge is to see whether these images that are have been produced to describe pictures are good or are fit to describe things of the past, which is one of the challenges of this project. So <clears throat> this is a, 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 a question which is important because we have to be aware that all these uh, data sets are, are based on photographs. They are, so they're, there are no paintings <laughs> inside. There are photographs. And most of the photographs are got through uh, search engines, like the uh, ImageNet or uh, the conceptual, um, conceptual images. And on the other side, there are the, the Coco data set and visual genome that the, the, photo, the photographs are taken from Flickr. So 
the thing is that, well, imagine that, uh, or say, uh, see that, for instance, if we take the Coco data set uh, Im uh, images, we know that most of them are taken from Flickr images, and Flickr images depict things of present day. So this is the challenge. The thing is, can these uh, data sets that mostly uh, represent uh, everyday or uh, current present day life are uh, fit to describe uh, things in paintings of the 15th century, for instance? So this is the challenge. Are photograph databases uh, fitting to uh, describe or describe uh, paintings up to the 19th century paintings, for instance. So, <clears throat> as I told you, if we take the, the entities that uh, port, uh, depicted in the Coco data set, we see that many, many, many of them are entities that were created in, in the 20th century. So notice there are bikes, there are traffic lights, there are signs, there are trucks, there are cell phones, computers, all these things. So of course, if what the painting is, was made in the 15th century, we don't expect to, to, see, to find a description saying this is a, it's a person holding a cell phone because the painting was made in the 15th century. But we know that the Coco data set contains many, many, many objects uh, that were created in the 20th century. So we did this exercise, we performed this exercise for all the data sets we uh, have, uh, have explained before. And we see that uh, although many, uh, most of the classes of, or the, of the entities that are portrayed in all the data sets appeared up to the 11th century. There are uh, 10 classes in, from 19th century to the 21st uh, century, and there are quite a lot. To perform this exercise to see when the entity uh, was created or appeared in documents, we used the Merriam-Webster uh, information dictionary. All these, uh, the, 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 the classes uh, shown here are those that appear more than 10,000 times. And notice here in this figure, we, we uh, mark the, the entities that uh, appear more than 10,000 times and uh, he appeared in the 20th century. Notice that there are signed car, airplane, a bus, and um, they are on the top, uh, more or less quite the top ranks. So there are many or so, uh, surfboard, so there are uh, many image uh, classes from the 20th 20, 20 century. So this is a challenge, so this is a challenge, no? And in that case, we, uh, in, in this figure, not only do we see the, the entities, but also the relationships. And we take the Coco data set rela entity relationships and, see, and we see that the most frequent relationship is between a man and a skateboard. The skateboard is clearly a 20, 20th century entity. And notice that uh, this is one of the most frequent actions. So this is, uh, this is when time matrix uh, is, uh, is important for us to, uh, to explain and, and to, to, to explain the, the, the reason why we use this notion. 
Well, to understand the time matrix thing, we have to understand that first we have the image representation and the, the image representation is a kind of matrix with different probability values. And you see here that the, the first row is the image representation and the, and the lighted, and the lighted uh, dots uh, mean uh, the most, the most probable, the most probably values, in order for the system to predict what is there in the in the picture, by using uh, by using a word. So notice the relationship between the dot, the lighted dots, or bird, and over, and so there is a relationship between the dotted, uh, um, the dot, the lighted dotted, which means that they, they have uh, predictable values in order to say that this region of the image uh, represents a bird, okay? So if we represent an image as a matrix of dots and each dot is a probability value, one thing is to say that the dots on, the, on this part of the image is a windsurf, then saying that on the right on the, the right uh, figure, saying that these dots, the probability of windsurf is lower than, for instance, the uh, probability that this is a wing or a, of an angel. So the thing is that if we put the first image in the 20, 20th century uh, framework, that could be a windsurf. But if we, if we put this image, this matrix in the 15th century, of course, the values should be changed. And instead of saying that this windsurf, we, we should say that this is a wing and maybe that person is an angel, not a windsurf. So the idea is, uh, is uh, here you have an example. And the first picture is the identification, the bounding box that uh, it says that it's a cell phone. So this is the probability, the entity probability detection for an image without any information about the, the time. So it says cell phone, but of course, this cannot be a cell phone because this page was uh, made in the 16th century. So the idea is how to change the probability values uh, in order to put the, uh, an object which is more probable according to time. And instead of saying cell phone, uh, our work is, uh, is focused on saying that uh, it, it, it's, it's a book rather than a cell. So this is the, 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 the introduction, the state of the art and uh, why, and uh, the reason why we are working on the time matrix notion. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hi, can I ask a question? Uh, sure, sure, okay. Hi, uh, hi thanks for the talk. Um, um, so when you explained the last part where you said that uh, we map uh, the first occurrence of that particular object in let's say 15th century. So I wanted to ask, uh, you would have metadata for that, right? So what kind of data set are you using and is it open source uh, yes uh, this will this will be uh, sorry uh, um, can you hear me yes i can yeah, yes so th this will be explained in, in uh, ongoing sections but of course we have metadata of this we have the from the uh, painting sources, uh, European and other sources, 
we know when the painting was uh, made and according to this we uh, we uh, performed the, the, the tuning okay thank you uh, so, um, your last example where would the corrective label come from <laughs> well this is the this is the, the, the well this will be uh, explained in a more detailed way uh, in the oncoming uh, sessions. But it just, uh, or more or less the idea is that we have uh, classes that, uh, from the Cocoa data set classes, we know which classes can be, uh, are not anachronical, according to the centuries. So if one is anachronical, then it calculates the the most probable, the, the next probable entity, which is not an account. But this will be explained, and uh, uh, my colleague will uh, give you or will uh, tell you the details of how this is done. Well, went on. Uh, let me see. What if museums put more object images before than tax? Uh, well, uh, what if museums put more object images with relevant tax, icon class already in, in museum implementation, or figure to get them included to the big classes? Yes, uh, this could be. This could be okay, and 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 I think that you know, the this kind. A project like this will encourage these uh, kind of uh, of actions. Uh, museums can be involved in 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 providing data sets on Flickr and other things. Now Flickr and the museums seem to be quite different. Uh, Flickr present day museum cultural heritage and. It, it, it would be good to share information from both data sets. I want to ask, can you share your categorization of keywords to time periods? Yes, but then when we talk about uh, this uh, more fully, we will uh, find uh, the possibility that we can share it. Uh, in your analysis of Coco, you had Elephant and Giraffe appearing at some point in documents. If you expanded this approach beyond European heritage, wouldn't you need a third dimension where these concepts appeared at a different time? If you go farther in time, I guess some of these elephant source appear. Yes, <clears throat> yes, of course. Uh, this, this is related to the, um, this is related to the, um, the, um, to the appearance. For, for instance, uh, the, um, there are uh, elephants, which are the, the the Roman Empire, but we need we need also to to know if the well in in, in that case if there is an, an image of an elephant of the Roman Empire there would be an, an, any any different we would say that it's a it's a train a, a, a different thing is when it says that it is a train, but instead of a train, it's a caravan. And uh, a caravan, it's uh, fitted to the, to the time, to 15th century, but not, uh, not trained in the means of transport. How do you map the WordNet related to Wikidata? Mary Webster, you can confuse your association for us. Um, no, the no, uh, WordNet labels are used for um, are used for uh, ImageNet and Visual Genome, but um, because they are in well, the, it's the, these other places come from Stanford University, which is the university that built up WordNet. So they are were interested in mapping the WordNet in, onto images. But um, one of the th one of the limitations of WordNet labels are that they are not descriptive enough for our intentions. So 
we prefer, um, as we will uh, tell you, uh, we prefer Wikimedia taxonomy, but they are quite, they are quite different. So there's no mapping between Warnet and, and, and Wikidata. And the Merriam-Webster is used just to know when the class appeared for the first time. It's, it's, it's used to filter out uh, entities or classes that, can, uh, that, that are an acronym. But it's, it's an instrument, it's a resource to, to perform this work. Yeah, there was an attempt to share pictures on Flickr, Flickr Commons. It's not very old, it's not for very old collections, but it's a photo. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the pictures shared, mostly of them are, are representations of everyday stuff. So it wasn't. Uh, uh, there are lots of museum pigs on Twitter, but they are normally captioned for using social media. Yeah, I uh, blog. Uh, this is a very, very, very interesting uh, issue. This is a very interesting issue. That uh, it would be great if the if the um, if in Twitter people said uh, what is depicted in the in the painting. But uh, it's a very it's a very important issue, and even it's a it's a good idea to perform crowdsourcing campaigns on Twitter and and, and every social um, media to share uh, how people or what people see in paintings. So we should get our social media departments for to use museum vocabulary as hashtags. Yes, that would be okay. <laughs> that would be fine, very fine. So we encourage museums to participate in in this kind of platforms and and visual uh, representations. Would be. And the idea of the project is is a uh, is a way of encouraging this this kind of uh, of actions. Uh, any other question? Okay, so if there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, okay, so the next talk is by Artem Reshetnikov, Training Data in Image Datasets. Um, hey to all. Uh, my name is Artem, and I'm deep learning researcher in Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Um, I'm really glad to meet you here in our webinar and hope that you will useful. It will be useful for you. Um, just one uh, question. Sometimes I have the problems with my uh, with internet connection. So if you can hear me properly, please write something in the, in the chat, and I would I will understand that everything is going well. Okay, I guess everything is going well, I hope at least. Um, um, now, uh, we're gonna talk about the training data in image data sets. And uh, my colleague Kim already mentioned some of the data sets and their features, but I would like to talk about the process of training. Uh, it's a bit different because we have to understand some some kind of like issues and challenges according uh, especially uh, taking into account the cultural heritage 
Uh, I will not go deeply into the technical details, uh, but please feel free to ask in the chat if you are curious, and I will try to answer after my presentation. Um, Take into account the history of the computer vision researchers, data sets have played a critical role. They not only provide a means to train and evaluate the algorithms, but they also drive research into new and more challenging directions. Um, some of the data sets were focused on like uh, specific classes. Some of them were focused on general tasks, but take into account the whole uh, amount, the whole set of data sets, we can um, roughly split um, the task of uh, computer vision into the three main groups. Um, one of them is image classification, one of them is object detection, and one of them is semantic synths. Uh, scene labeling. Um, let's make a quick review of all of them because I mean um, I have uh, as far as I understood so the, the level of uh, the understanding of these kind of tasks of audience of the webinar is different so that's why I would like to make the quick review. The task of image classification requires a binary labels indicating whether the objects are presented in, a, in, in an image or not. So it's pretty clear task where we try to classificate if there is a dog on the image or not, if there is a cat on image or not. Um, the simplest um, and good example of this task is classification of uh, handwriting numbers or letters. We don't need information about the position of the object. We don't need information about his features or any additional information. Um, this is classical task of machine learning and it's kind of like the easiest one. Um, the second task is more focused on uh, a part of detection of the object. It's focused on understanding where the object is uh, located. Um, the first algorithms of object detection uh, were focused mostly on face detection or and uh, another popular challenge is, is detection of pedestrians or something like that. Um, at uh, 2005, um, the data set started providing the more information about the classes and uh, um, there were several data sets which, created, which were created for object detection especially and one of them was the COCO data set, another one was uh, Pascal uh, um, Visual Objects data set. Um, the task of uh, labeling semantic objects in the theme requires that each pixel uh, of, the, of the image be labeled as belonging to a category, such as a sky, chair, floor, street, uh, dog, etc., etc., etc. In contrast to the detection task, individual instances of objects do not need it to be segmented. This enables uh, the labeling of objects for which in individual instances are hard to define, such as a grass, streets, or walls. Um, the data sets exist, uh, exist for both indoors and outdoor scenes. Um, segmentation is really interesting task, especially for us as well, because we would like to detect the objects on the paintings and to understand where it's located. But it's pretty difficult because there is no any kind of data set for this task, especially with focus on the paintings. In the future, we will talk about the challenges uh, of detection. And you will understand why um, this is kind of critical issue for us. Um, a part of it, I would like to talk about the metadata. So metadata basically, by traditional definition, uh, is a data which used to describe another data. Um, what kind of metadata can be useful for us? So it can be name of a file, source, or license. Take into account that normally data sets contain information from different data sources. Sometimes it's useful to have uh, additional information about uh, where's the file from and how we can use it. Obviously, it's really important to us to understand the, the classes of objects. Um, 
we have to understand it, uh, I mean, we have to understand it uh, as for like classification task, for segmentation task, and for object deletion task, it doesn't matter. So it's kind of like K, uh, K metadata in, in, in our project. Uh, if you are talking about set of the objects, we are talking about the location, the position, and uh, uh, such kind of metadata. Uh, which normally represented in the form of um, coordinates and um, binary pixelation of the image belonging to some, some classes. Um, another form of metadata is relationship between the objects and uh, my colleague Kim already talked about it. Um, it's kind of like, it can be a visual relationship or linking or just caption. Um, the, the, simplest, the simplest caption like person on a horse, uh, TV on a wall or person on a bike, something like that. Um, for any segmentation task, uh, as I already told, uh, we need a specific metadata. So it can be like, uh, the matrix or the masks, how it's called, the masks, um, with pixels, where, where the, each pixel has a label according to the class it falls, it falls into. Um, so if we will use um, the two most popular forms of metadata, we can see that it's, it was Pascal or Coco. On the right side, you can see the, the, the form of metadata of Coco dataset. Uh, it stores in, uh, Coco stores annotation in a JSON file. Um, this will help to create uh, the data using the, I mean, uh, this will help to, to, to create the, the, the whole data set in, 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 in a one file because uh, the Pascal format is normally created the file with metadata for each file in data set. Um, the Coco format normally includes the info, the information about the file, the licenses, as I told before, the categories or classes, um, the images, um, the unique um, name or unique indicator of image, and um, annotations. Um, taking talk, uh, Normally, annotations is uh, is um, is a class which normally objects related to uh, the position of bounded box and the masks uh, for segmentation uh, for segmentation uh, tasks. Part of it, sometimes annotations uh, contain the information about the, the captions or such kind of stuff, which Kim already talked about. Um, the, the, on the left side, the Pascal work uh, provides standardized uh, image data set for object detection. Um, the difference between Coco and Pascal uh, data formats will quickly help understand the two data formats. So the Pascal work is an XML file, like the Coco, which has a JSON file. In Pascal work, we create a file for each of the images, as I told before. Um, and the bounding boxes in Pascal format uh, has different uh, standards. So it's a um, coordinate of uh, um, top left corner and uh, bottom right corner as well. So this is the difference. Uh, but right now I would like to focus on the metadata which related to the paintings because in that case we have a different type which we can use. Um, here you can see some kind of examples uh, of metadata which can be used in time matrix in the future or in other approaches of uh, correction. First of all, of it's a captions, of course. We would like to have a huge data set with good captions, but we don't. Um, second, uh, type of metadata is the name of the author because it's really interesting uh, for time context and for style context. Date of creation, uh, we will use it in time matrix. Some kind of tags, uh, country and region, 
Um, so it's it's about the equation uh, about the elephant and giraffe. <coughs> Uh, some of titles provide really interesting metadata and uh, it can be used in object detection in the future and provider. So it's the name of museum, it's the name of uh, organization, host organization or something like that. Um, I know that the, the level of audience is different, but I just would like to show you the, the general pipeline of training of the any object detection or classification model. Um, so first of all, we are working on data gathering. After that, we are working on data preparation. Uh, we define the model architecture. We turn in uh, the model's parameters. We training. We evaluating the model, and we are coming back to turning the model parameters. And uh, it's kind of a loop where we are working on the uh, achieving the good results. Why I'm showing this slide? It's really important because uh, in the future, we will come back to this slide and we will see the difference because um, the, the, the pipeline of time matrix is a bit different and it's a key point of the idea of time matrix. <clears throat> um, what, right now, I would like to talk about the challenges. Uh, the challenges of training um, of the model take into account the cultural heritage. So, I mean, most of all, I'm pretty sure most of all uh, knows the challenges of working with uh, traditional data set like Coco, Flickr, ImageNet, etc. Et so the main challenges is architecture of the neural, net neural network, the, um, the computational resources, the time consuming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here we, are, we have another challenges. Um, first of all, it's the uh, position of the objects. We can have occlusions, we can uh, have uh, some kind of problems with objects, uh, we can have overlapping, et cetera, et cetera. Second challenge is limited data. It's, it's a key point for us and it's like, big issue, big challenge for us because we are working on it for like for, for a lot of time. Um, another challenge is contextual information. Because uh, some, some paintings contain the information which not related to just objects. And I will explain a bit, uh, I will explain about it later and uh, class imbalances. So it's a problem of every data set, but in uh, cultural heritage, it's, it's, it's a big problem as well. And of course, computational power. S here we can uh, see some kind of examples of inclusions and, uh, and problems with form of the objects, uh, which normally influence on the possibility of object detection. So it's, it can be like connection or overlapping of the objects. It can be just part of the objects. It can be like some, some, some and other problems. On the first image we have, we, we, we see the dogs. On the second image we see the sheep and it's kind of traditional or um, iconic um, example of occlusions. Um, the same problem on the third one uh, with the boat and the man. But here we have a problem of style as well. I will explain later. Um, symbolic information. So it's kind of key point of our project um, because a part of object detection, we have to understand what's going on on the painting and we would like to detect it. But the point that normally all paintings are symbolic and a part of the general objects like man, person, tree, uh, horse, we have to understand the connection between these two uh, or three objects. And it would be the main idea of the painting, which we would like to detect. So on the uh, first image, you can see the angel, the flower, and the book, and the woman. And so normally, set of these four objects related to Annunciation. Obviously, there is some differences. So sometimes the angel is without flower, sometimes there is no book. 
but normally this kind of like set of objects uh, relate to an annunciation. On the second image, you can see the person with two keys, with two keys. And uh, if the person holding a key, normally it, uh, the name of the, normally it's a Saint Peter. And we would like to understand what, what the person is. So it can be like, uh, if we are detecting the key, if you are detecting the, the person, it can be like the, 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 the hint that the person is Saint Peter. In the same situation with a uh, third uh, example, where the woman, child, and three kings. So normally this, this type, this set of objects related to adoration of Mikey. But here we have another problem, how we can detect that the person is a king. This type of symbolic information is really interesting and it's really difficult to integrate to the training process. And time matrix, which we will talk, uh, we'll talk later, is kind of the first step of doing this. So here you have just uh, general examples of neural network, which we tried and which, which are state of the art right now in object detection and in, um, in segmentation. That's all. Uh, it was pretty short. Um, pretty short presentation, and I see that some question, and I would like to, I would be glad to to answer. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm talking about the. Uh, first and two stage detectors. Um, why is the painting size of manor craft used in making it not usually included in metadata? Might not be useful in narrowing down its nature and time frame in case caption are missing. Size of manor. Um, Taking into account the architecture of neural networks, I'm not sure that the size is critical or it's essential because normally the neural network will, uh, will change the size of the image. So I guess it's not a key point. Um, a part of it, a part of it, it depends of the, of the, of the format of metadata. Um, because in, in Coco data set, um, you have to indicate the size, but in Pascal uh, data set, you don't have to indicate the data size because it's, it's, it's already included in, in position of the object. So it's, it's depend in some, some, in some cases, it's kind of like necessary. In some cases it's not, that's why I decided not to include it into the examples of metadata. But it was just examples, taking into account that the metadata can be much, like, have much more examples, so that's why. Uh, are you trying to get all three steps of art historical analysis after Panfoski model or pre-iconographical, iconographical, iconological description done in step of IE-based analysis? Um, it's pretty interesting question. It's pretty interesting question because we thought about it. We thought about it, but it's pretty difficult to make uh, to make all three steps in one. That's why we are trying to, to go in step by step. But the main idea of the project, yes. So try to do all three steps in, in some kind of artificial intelligence based technology or metric, I, I don't know, something like that. Uh, 
Um, okay. Uh, for, I guess, the metadata about the techniques and materials, you get all painting on canvas, which might be really, especially when training new models. It's something you're looking into. Um, yes and no. Because the next session, next my session, will be about transfer learning. And we, are, we will be talking about why it's essential to use the transfer learning in, 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 uh, in working with cultural heritage. Why? Because um, the limitation of that, we, can't, we cannot train the model from scratch. So it means that we will not train the new models. We will use the, the, the information from previous model and we will uptrain it. Uh, regarding to the, the materials, um, yes, um, not about the materials, but about the techniques. Yes, it's, it's the, this type of metadata is really relevant, but we not it uh, include into this separate class of metadata because um, the model will understand the style of the painting if you will have enough example. And I will show you some examples uh, later about the expressionism and impressionism these types of uh, these two styles of the painting of 19th century and it was kind of like um, issue for us um, and we will talk about it because it's really interesting topic. Um, I'm not sure about the materials um, because we had many experiments with different types of the paintings like based on the like watercolor the, the oil um, the sketches, um, just, I mean, some different kinds of, of, of images, uh, like in, in case of materials, but we didn't find any significant uh, difference in, in detection of the, in, in detecting of the objects. So the main, the key, the key, um, one of the most important issues for us was style, as I told before, and we will talk about it later. Any more questions? Rosanne? Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, ah, okay, one yeah. question. One question. Can you hear me? I'll ask a question speaking, if I may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Artem, hello. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering whether there's um, an evolution in the representation of objects uh, in a multi-object image uh, across time, meaning um, do you see a difference between superposition of objects uh, between the 15th and the 20th century. Have you seen anything like this? Mm. Is there more, more super, superposition today than before or the country or depends on the, on the, on the topic of the painting, perhaps? Uh, is, there, is there any structure there? Is there any information? The, yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you're talking about. The problem that uh, it's pretty difficult to define this structure. We can see it by the, the some, some kind of experiments, and we can see that, that the set of objects is like mm, um, going down from the present time to the past time. But it's pretty difficult to, to define this structure. Why, for example, the set of the objects here is like uh, is really for the 20th century and why the different set of the objects is really one for the 12th century. Uh, that's why we are trying to, firstly, we are, first, first of all, the, the, the project right now has two different uh, directions. 
and I will talk about it later as well. Uh, one direction is just object detection. So we trained uh, our own model based on 53 chronic classes, which normally related to the uh, cultural heritage, and we will talk about it. So these kind of classes um, uh, included the angels, the devils, the unicorns, such kind of stuff, which not which which cannot appear in uh, in state of our data sets. Um, the another, another type, or another way of the project is time matrix. So we are trying to use the current uh, models, already trained models, but just uh, in, but use the step of correction. So when we are see that the cell phone on the model on the on the on the image uh, detected by the model, we are trying to say to explain the model that no cell phone is not relevant for this painting because this painting was created in 16th century and the uh, cell phone appeared in 20th century. But we don't have the, the clear structure of this of the of the set of the objects for the like current paintings and the paintings of 12th century. So I hope I answered for your question or if not, let me let me know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Rose. Okay. Uh, okay, so if nobody has any more questions, let's take a break. Um, let's take a 17 minute break. We'll resume at 10.45. direction of research and do something else where we, could, we cannot do large calculations. We work in a university hospital in here in Barcelona. Our main interest is the study of a particular type of cancer, cancer that originates in blood cells, leukemias and lymphomas. And thanks to the new technologies to sequence the DNA, we are now able to analyze uh, the genomic alterations of these cancers. We compare the sequence of the DNA with other layers of information. To integrate all these different layers of information, the supercomputer here is helping us to obtain a very clear information. More important, we are discovering new targets uh, for uh, new therapies that uh, for sure will improve the quality of life of our patients. My research is focused on the computational fluid dynamics and specifically about the simulation of the, uh, the wind speed around the wind farms. Thanks to the supercomputing, we are able to go one step above in the simulation of the wind speed, going to the next level of the computational fluid dynamic models.
Hello, my name is Mathias. I am from France and I love Eurobiana. Because the real one can be destroyed or damaged, uh, but in the internet it's been safe. Cultural heritage is very important because it finds who we are, uh, it shows where we came from, our background. I think it's important because we can compare other Euro European countries and uh, their heritage and create lots of digital lessons about our differences and similarities. Alors, en fait, on, elle nous a montré des hein? portraits et elle nous a dit si trois portraits c'était des portraits et nous on a essayé de deviner. We were from the European project, New State Bank Report. I really like this project as we have, because we have the choice to choose our own title and even write about the two of them. I think European Mia makes lessons more interesting. Lately, I've been using Europeana.eu websites regularly. I want to study architecture, so I'm preparing for this by doing drawings of buildings or still life. With this website, I can easily look for inspiration for my drawing. I use Europeana to tell my vacances to the Isles Canaries. In Europeana, you can tell stories to all the people of the world. And we use Europeana to analyze pictures, for example. We also watch videos, we produce posters, and we use TV and European is a perfect place for a treasure hunt in the past, so we decided on a sci-fi theme project. We are journalists from the year 2024 who found a postcard in a museum cellar. We decided to go back in time and interview the person who wrote this uh, postcard. Your band is very interesting with a lot of beautiful images, music recordings and collections. I like that it has a lot of things that are so different from many countries and many subjects. I like the music collection very much. Europeana is a great educational project and it is exactly what we needed for interesting classes. I think it's very interesting and it's a useful resource for learning and it helps us understand to the past civilizations that are different from ours. Okay, uh, it's 10.45, we should start. Um, okay, the next talk is by Kim, and he will talk about uh, present state-of-the-art caption generators and their limitations. Can you, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so well, um, let's see. Well, so, well, let me introduce now to the topic of present state of the art caption generators and their limitations when dealing with anachronic images. Well, this is more or less the, the fun part of, the, of the, uh, today's presentation which is uh, we will show you the results of how the systems that describe paintings trained by, by data set images perform when they uh, have to describe uh, a painting loc located in the 15 or 14 or 16th century, for instance. So, we will see some examples. For instance, let's see this one. Here we have the, the St. George. St. George with the dragon, the horse, uh, whatever. 
you can you can see the bounding boxes here the bounding boxes that frame saint george the bounding box that framed the horse the bounding box that framed the, the dragon but notice that the the captions automatically generated by the systems is a motorcycle that is sitting in the dirt a motorcycle parked in front of the building or a black and white photo of a motorcycle on display and so notice that there is the motorcycle entity uh, appearance that of course uh, in in the context in the time context of the painting motorcycle cannot be but uh, you can guess why this happens this the, the system that uh, generates the captions for this painting uh, is trained with a coco data set uh, classes so as uh, as i told you before a classes in located uh, that appeared in the 20 in the 20th century are very predominant in the in the data set so the system when it detects a person on something on something this something is more likely to be a motorbike than a horse in in the, the uh, according to the coco data set uh, so in this case there is the relationship between a person and something which is uh, which the, the person is on and it uh, predicts that this thing should be a motorcycle so for this reason there is there are many motorcycles in the in the in the variant or the, the generation uh, caption of this image for in that case we, uh, we, here we have a man wearing a hat and hat with a snowboard notice that the snowboard is all is if you remember the snowboard was one of the most uh, predominant uh, class in Coco data set. So uh, the thing is that whenever it detects a figure which has more or less a shape resembling a snowboard, so the snowboard is the is the first option. Op option. Of course, in that case, the snowboard is anachronic, which uh, in the time of the painting, uh, snowboards even. Or not another case uh, there is a, a painting of the, uh, the of the man holding a, a lily and a book <clears throat> notice that there is no mention to a lily a plant or whatever why because lilies plants and so are not in the coco data set uh, uh, cl class and in other uh, open sorry in, in other uh, image that I said plants flowers and and so are not very uh, predominant in the in the data set so in that case the lily which is which seems to be a very important object the focus is not uh, there's not nothing about it so it it's focused on the book which is uh, took as a remote. Of course, remote is another anachronic entity, but uh, it's quite uh, frequent in data sets like Coco. So, in the caption generation, they uh, the, the system uh, detects a relationship between a person and something uh, on his hand. So, according to the training data the most likely uh, entity held by a person is a remote in that case and horizontally yeah, because it's it's another position it could take as a cell phone uh, the other painting of saint george killing the dragon says that a brown and white dog on a motorcycle so here uh, 
motorcycle, motorbikes again, and it, the, the, the reason is the same. There is, a, there is a relationship between a person and something the person is on, so the predicted uh, entity, according to this uh, relation, is that this thing is a, is a motorcycle. And notice uh, again that there's no mention or no uh, labeling of the dragon. That's because the dragons are not in the entities labeled by by in the in the image data sets. So it, it's it's a class that is not detected. So in that case, there's no there's no label. And in that case, uh, we have well the, the the painting of what it seems to be a king, but it only says that this is a person, okay, could wear. There is an animal, which is uh, there is an animal because in the in background there is a horse, and instead of saying that he's wearing a crown, it says that he's wearing a hat. Why? Because crowns are not entities uh, depicted in the uh, image data sets. So the class crown is not uh, taken uh, in, into account. So they say, no, it's a hat. But of course, uh, we should be more precise when we should refine and say that this hat is, uh, is a crown. And Later on in other sessions, we will see that this is very important if, because if we know that the thing worn by this person is a crown, we can predict that this person is likely to be a king, not just a person. And so that's, that's it. So these are uh, the presentation of the limitations uh, of. Uh, of current systems when trying to describe uh, paintings uh, uh, of the past. So thank you. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. Okay, the next talk will be by Artem, Transfer Learning to Describe Cultural Heritage Images. Um, in my previous presentation, I was talking about the two main waves, ways of, of the project is time matrix and object detection. And uh, for both of them, we decided to use transfer learning. In my current presentation, I will explain why. I will explain a bit uh, about transfer learning in general, and I will explain the whole pipeline of using transfer learning in our project. Uh, but first, let's talk about some topics which is a bit different. I would like to, to talk about the possible description how we can describe cultural heritage in general. Um, definitely, we could use a caption. However, caption generation is an area of active research right now. And despite of good results of attention mechanism or some kind of other models, caption generation can be still problematic for paintings, especially because of the symbolic meaning of many objects, lack of the lack of the high quality data and some other issues. Another form of, this, of describing of uh, cultural heritage is uh, multi-class classification or tagging. We talked about it before, it's just about saying what kind of like possible objects appeared on the, on the, on the painting. And the last one, which I would like to mention, I mean, definitely there are a lot of different ways of describing of cultural heritage is object detection. Um, this approach proved to us information 
give us information about the set of objects and their position um, and their position. This information can be converted into some form of captions or represent symbolic information of the objects depicted in the image. How it can be done, we will review later. Uh, but I would like to to explain why. Uh, I mean, I would like to. Add, I, I wanted to add this slide just to explain why we decided to focus on object detection, especially. So um, this is key point for us, and we use object detection in bo both both ways of the of the project in time matrix and in object detection. But when we started to review the possibility of training the model of object detection, we found we faced some um, some issues. Um, we faced some issues. Um, first of all, um, these issues was related to the data. Second, it was related to the compu uh, computational power. Uh, and after it was related to some kind of stuff. I will I will explain it later, but right now I just wanted to, to focus on the on on this slide and just to explain what uh, transfer learning is. So as far as you know, maybe you know, maybe you don't, uh, the types of training uh, can be divided into the training from scratch when we are preparing the whole data set and uh, defining the architecture of the model and training from the from the scratch and the transfer learning. Transfer learning is a machine learning technique uh, where the knowledge of previous pre-trained models used in the current model. So we just extract the matrix of weights put in our model and uh, started from this point. These techniques allows us to, to use less computational power to be less time consuming and to prepare the less data. Uh, this is key point why we decided to use transfer learning for both object detection and time matrix. Uh, in my previous slide, I showed you this pipeline and uh, like more or less, I showed you this pipeline and um, here you can see one more step which we already added. So we decided to use the model based on the uh, Cocoa dataset classes. We extracted the time, uh, the, we extracted the matrix uh, of weights and put it into our architecture and we used the mask RCNN arch architecture and started to train in the model from this point. Uh, we prepared the dataset as well, and we trained the, the, uh, the, the model use transfer learning. But there is another step uh, which calls possible correction. As a corrector can be used the time matrix implementation or it can be another approach using any kind of metadata. So after the training model and after the model prediction, we use some kind of post algorithm or pre algorithm or um, any kind of idea of correction, which correct the, the, uh, the set of the object detected by the model. And after that, we receive the final set of the detected objects. Uh, why we decided to use this pipeline or the use the idea of transfer learning? Because some challenges or some issues of object detection in a painting. Uh, first of all, oops, sorry. First of all, it's lack of the manually labeled high quality data, especially in cultural heritage. We have a lot of data in the museums, we have a lot of data in some kind of repositoriums, but the point that this data is badly labeled. Because sometimes captions, a part of the set of objects, a part of the uh, essential information, contain information about the writer, uh, contain information about the style of the painting, contain information about the history of the painting or something like that. And we spend a lot of time trying to, uh, to overcome this problem. Uh, second uh, issue is real life objects don't concern the whole set depicted in the paintings. So as Kim said that uh, the Coco data set uh, contain 80 classes, but there are the, the, there is no any, there is, the, 
there is no classes which we would like to detect as well in the, on the painting, such as like unicorns, angels, lances, swords, crowns, and etc. etc. Kim just explained in the previous presentation. The specific meaning of the class is based on the time period. It's really interesting and it's really cool, according to my opinion. I will explain it a bit like, on the next slide, and I hope you will find it in, you will find it interesting. The symbolic meaning of the classes, we will talk about it later. Uh, style of the paintings, uh, we talked in my previous presentation. So the object detection and the time matrix, uh, the, the detection of the, 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 the style of the paintings can influence on the object detection based on the, the techniques or the materials. And lack of sufficient uh, training data for objects which doesn't exist in real world. I'm talking about the devils, unicorns, angels. For example, if you would like to train the model which will detect the chair, you can make the thousands and thousands uh, different pictures, different photos of the of the chair, which is which is not not possible to uh, to do with uh, objects which don't exist. You cannot catch the angle and you cannot catch the angel and make uh, thousands take thousands of pictures of the angel. Um, so let's review a bit more about some, let's review a bit more some issues and some challenges. Here you see the, uh, the three examples of specific sets of the objects on, uh, on paintings. Uh, on the first painting, you can see the, the angel with a flower. I mean, definitely the flowers, uh, the class flower, uh, there is a class flower in the Coco data set, but the point that in, on the painting, sometimes the flower represented in a different way. The second one uh, is about King. Uh, Kim already said that crowned, uh, the class crown is not in, in Coco data set, but a part of the crown, we can talk about the orb, we can talk about the skipper, we can talk about um, Mantia, we can talk about the closest of King, which we would like to detect, but it's, but it's impossible to detect. So that's why we have to train, train our own model or use the time matrix. But at the same time, the lack of data doesn't allow us um, to train from the scratch. And the sword painting as well. So we, we, we can see the person, horse, uh, dragon, and uh, lens. Even the lens exists in the real world. We, we don't have enough data for lenses. Um, we talked several times about uh, time matrix and putting the objects in a time, time vector uh, and detecting the objects according to the uh, date of creation, creation of, of, uh, um, of the painting. But at the same time, we have some, some kind of challenge with it, because he, let's imagine the, that we decided to apply the time matrix to the traditional, to the state of the art Coco, uh, the, to the state of the art model based on the Coco data set. There is a class track in a model, uh, in a model. In our traditional definition, the track is, uh, is something for moving heavy articles. It's kind of big car, for example. Uh, but uh, Marion Webster vocabulary gives us that the, the word struct appeared in 17th century. And if we will apply our idea of time matrix for uh, the paintings uh, which created in 17th or 18th century, it means the track can appear on these paintings. But if we will define the, the, the meaning of track in, of, of the word track in 18th century, we we'll understand that it was completely different. It was a small, strong wheel for a gun. And we have to understand this kind of differences and we have to take into account this kind of differences when we are talking uh, about the uh, object detection on paintings. Um, I will explain later in a demo or session um, how we over, over, overcame this, uh, this, this problem because we, 
this kind of problem like happens with a lot of different classes. Thai, broccoli, banana, etc. Et et um, we already talked about symbolic meaning of the classes and it's really interesting for us and we are trying to understand how to implement it into the, into the model, into the object detection model and we have some good results. Here you can see two paintings. Uh, on the first painting, we can see just a man with a sword, and sword doesn't have any significant, any, any symbolic meaning. But at the same time, at the same time, on the left painting, um, the sword has symbolic meaning. Why? Um, because uh, during the some ages, normally angel with a sword is uh, San Michael. So there was kind of tradition according to the Bible and according to the uh, to some I don't know. Um, so if you have the angel with a sword, normally the angel is San Michael, and the sword has in that case has symbolic meaning. Using the uh, the information that the model detected the angel and detected the sword, it means that we can say that this angel is San Michael. And we cannot say the same for the uh, painting on the left side because it's just a man and just, uh, just a sword. So, and right now we are trying to implement this kind of symbolic uh, meaning of classes into the neural network to be able to detect not just angel and sword, but San Michael or San George or San Gabriel or another, another um, such kind of set of objects. Yeah, here we are talking about style of paintings. It's really interesting and it's really difficult for us. Especially we, are, we have problems with paintings of 19th century. As I told before, 19th and 20th century was the time of uh, creation of impressionism and expressionism style of the paintings. Uh, Neoclassicism, uh, realism and neorealism is, is a typical uh, style of painting, painting which really um, easy can be detected by the, by the model. So on the, on the uh, first image, uh, on the first painting, we can uh, clearly, we can clearly see the, the, the figures of uh, persons and the model can detect it pretty easy. The second uh, image is more, a bit more difficult because uh, here the author used the watercolor uh, technique and um, the shapes are a bit blue. In some cases model can detect, in some cases model can not detect objects on this style of paintings. And the last one is a typical example of, uh, of the problem of style of the painting. All of us understand that it's person, but it's extremely hard to explain this to the model. And we are trying to work with it. The problem that we cannot create thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of this person, just to explain the model that it's person. And we have to find another solution. And transfer learning was, was one of them. And uh, time matrix will show that in some cases it, it, it helps as well. Uh, we talked about the unicorns already. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I talked about the lack of uh, training data for objects which doesn't, we don't exist in real world. We can talk about angels, unicorns, devils, supernatural stuff, um, about some animals which already not exist or, I don't know. The problem that we cannot create more, uh, we cannot create uh, enough data, enough training data for this kind of object and we have to find the solutions how to do it. Uh, we made some experiments and we understood that, for example, Unicorn can be detected by detecting horse and core. The angels can be detected by uh, person and wings. 
it's pretty difficult to detect devil and we are trying to understand how to do it. But this algorithm of splitting the uh, objects into two objects is, can be helpful for us in the future to detect the supernatural objects and even for overcoming this, uh, uh, the problem of uh, lack of data. That's all. I'm ready to answer your questions. Um, no, uh, Angel, Blue, Angel and Sword is not always San Michael. Some it can be San San San. I don't remember the name. Another one. But um, take into account that we, we we made some small analysis of European data set, and we found that um, in a lot of cases we this pattern is work. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Any more questions? Um, about the icon class. We will talk about it later because I, would, um, I will explain about our own data set, which right now um, consists of 4K images, which we label it manually. And we used icon class as a training, as a, as a part of this data set. So we will talk about it later and I will explain. Icon class was really uh, useful, but even icon class um, has some, 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 some issues. Um, how do you figure to use of unsupervised training for such data then? Could it be easier since the object classes are not fixed? Maybe with unsupervised approach, the, the object classes are flexible. Um, we thought about it. Yes, so for example, we, we, can, we can try the, the clustering or such kind of techniques just to understand the groups of, uh, of, of images. And uh, for example, after that, we can manually detect it or something like that, or, or uh, explore the, the detected class to, to, to whole cluster. Uh, but I don't know, we thought about it and we tried, but I don't know, we decided to focus on the, the object detection and the time matrix. Of course, we found it more useful in case of symbolism. Mm, just because of it. Do you think about integrating pictures from e sky fi movies? <laughs> they often work with imagery recorder to ancient artworks, then stop then stop photography. Um, it makes sense at least. And uh, we tried some kind of like Gantt uh, gener generative artificial networks uh, to generate the the stylish paintings from uh, from from images from photos. And yeah, I mean this kind uh, this kind of um, pictures from sky fi, sky fi movies can be used as well. But the problem, the main problem. Hey, I'm sorry, I guess I have some, some troubles with internet right now. You can, you can hear me, right? Yes. Ah, cool. So about Skyfi movies. Um, the problem that is, uh, the, the, we have, for example, European, European collection. And yes, we can extract the, the necessary the, the enough amount of, of images for training from using transfer learning. It's not a big deal. But the problem that this type of images is not manually labeled. So the, the, the structure of metadata is not um, good for, uh, for neural networks. And we have to do it like manually, which takes a lot of time. We can use the SkyFi movies, as the, the pictures from SkyFi uh, movies, and it can be like great, I guess, it's a good idea and we didn't think about it. But um, the, main, the main problem is not the, the lack of images. The, ma the main problem is lack of metadata for these images. 
Any more questions? I guess no. Rosa? Okay. So if there aren't any more oh, questions. Sorry, sorry. We, we have oh, questions sorry. more. Uh, using guns to change the style of images. Do you work with metadata created by Artigo project? Um, about guns. Um, the experiments was really nice. Um, we have two issues. First of all, um, it takes time. So even for example, with, with Barcelona supercomputer cluster, we could generate these images, but it takes time. And we cannot do it like thousands and thousands and thousands. And the second issue that guns normally generate image from, generate the painting from the image, from the photo. And we cannot make the photo of Angel to generate the, the painting of Angel. That's the problem. Um, Uh, do you work with metadata created by Artigo project? To be honest, I, I have, I didn't know about this project and I would be glad and I would be grateful if you would send the link because it's really interesting and I would, we would be check, we, we would check it. Okay, okay, thanks, we will find it and we will try. Okay, if there, oh. No, it's just, just link. Okay. All right, if there are no more questions, let's move on to the final talk for today uh, by Maria Cristina. It will be a wrap up and she will be connecting the dots to see the bigger picture. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, um, as Rose was saying, this is basically just a general overview. Um, I thought uh, we're gonna run late. We usually, most people run late. So I hope, thought I'm just gonna have 10 minutes. I'm gonna have a lot more time, so we'll figure out what to do with the rest. Maybe we'll finish earlier, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> I just want to summarize what we talked about today, very briefly, with no detail, basically introduce what we're going to talk about tomorrow, the, what the sessions are about, and um, maybe you, like, people have different ways of learning, so some people learn very well by looking at the pieces and then combining them, extracting them, combining them easily, and some people need a bigger picture, so for um, those of you that need a bigger picture, in which I introduce myself, I'm part of that group, um, I'm basically going to try to, to give you a, a general overview of, of uh, how the pieces fits in terms of what you saw today, what you're going to see tomorrow. It's not precisely um, um, the, what, what we're talking about because there, as Artem, for example, was saying, there are different variants of like transfer learning, fixing the object, using the time matrix, and um, another language-based um, approach that you're going to hear Kim talking about tomorrow. But it's, uh, it's sort of putting things in place. So what did we talk about today? Um, we introduced, excuse me, we introduced the time matrix. Uh, what was the time matrix? It was basically um, you have an image, you have the matrix for that image that gives probabilities for those regions in the image um, where it recognizes certain objects and when you apply uh, this time context based on the time of first use conceptually you can use other things like the frequency of appearance of these classes over time um, you transform the original matrix of the image into another matrix which we call the time matrix which basically gives different weights so instead of having uh, you know, the motorcycle, you get a horse, okay? 
So we introduced the time matrix. Um, Kim explained the semantic labeling. Uh, basically, the semantic labels that we're looking at at this point are Coco labels. Um, he's going to explain tomorrow how you filter based on time. Um, the anachronic Coco classes to only uh, maintain the Coco classes that are uh, appropriate for the time period that, uh, that the painting was, was produced. And uh, he's also going to explain briefly how, um, how we added different classes, mostly based on Wikimedia Commons, to be able to refine uh, notions as person, because the Coco data set um, only has person, but it doesn't have, I don't know, um, um, shepherd or monk or, and we want to be able to talk about this, this concept. So he's gonna talk about a little bit how we selected the set of classes that we're looking at in a fundamental way. Um, Artem talked about the training data, both in terms of images and a little bit in, in, in terms of the metadata associated with the images. And he mentioned here this uh, data set of uh, 4K paintings. Uh, I don't know how much he's going to explain tomorrow about it, but this is manually labeled. Uh, we saw a little bit the state of the art. And we saw this part over here, which is um, just the previous talk of how we're using transfer learning, um, starting from, excuse me, I don't know what's going on, starting from the COCO pre-trained model uh, so that we save time and computational resources. So this is what we've done today. What are we gonna do tomorrow? These are the names of the sessions for tomorrow. Um, if you look at them, you can resume them basically around these two um, items. One of them, Jesus, one of them um, talks about the second one, talks about how to uh, place things in context and correct of the object detector such that it generates uh, the night killing the dragon rather than a man uh, on a horse with a dog. So Artem will talk about that. And uh, this is based on the time matrix idea. And the second big chunk is um, the first item that you, hear, you see here pointed out with an arrow, which is uh, an entirely new approach um which is basically instead of manually generating a lot of images and training over these images and manually add things like you know shepherd and warrior and um i don't know monk okay this is an approach that explains how you can generate these labels from a set of labels that's not that does not exist without having to manually label a lot of images. And this approach is based on a language model. And Kim will explain uh, how this model works. I'm sure this will be, it's gonna be very interesting for you. Again, I think this is very clear already from the many talks, but I'm just, I just want to underline why we're using the COCO data set. Uh, we're using the COCO data set because it represents the actual world. There are pictures of the actual world and this gives us the challenge um, of um, basically being able to, to develop this uh, technology that, that identifies correctly images in their time context rather than um, detecting objects of the real world. And this is just, I'm going to finish with this big picture. Um, I know I have time but I'm not going to spoil uh, the fun for tomorrow. I'm just gonna show a little bit of the structure here. So basically these are the, the paintings with the manual, um, manually labeled with the captions. We're using the COCO data set pre-trained, excuse me, and the uh, COCO pre-trained model um, to do 
object detection, we're using the time matrix to do object correction. These use transfer learning. What are the classes that we're using in this part of the figure? The classes that we're using, the set of classes for transfer learning come from two sources, as I was saying. Um, classes related to person from Wikimedia Commons. Things like person with sword, person with dragon, person with meter. And we filter out anachronic classes to get rid of cell phones and motorcycles and TVs and remotes. Okay. Uh, on the right hand side of the figure, over here, all this right hand side of the figure, you see the approach that I was mentioning that is based on a language model um, to basically refine um, concepts. So if your bounding boxes say that you have a person and a sword, then this model is going to say, okay, person with sword, the most probable relation is with, and is probably a warrior. And I'm going to leave you there and I'm not going to explain more. So I hope you come back tomorrow and you listen to this talk, which I think is very interesting. Thank you very much and uh, waiting for questions. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no further questions and comments, then we will end here. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow for day two of the Time Matrix for Research webinar. And we will be talking about technical implementation of the Time Matrix. Okay, so thank you very much and see you all tomorrow. Oh, there's a question. Ah. Uh, excuse me. Okay. Okay. Never mind. I think Antoine already. Thank you very much. Ah. And um, we will be putting the recording um, uh, soon, but after tomorrow. So maybe Friday or Monday. And we will be sending you a notification. Okay. Thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you tomorrow. <laughs>